Welcome to Impact Unicorns, the podcast where you meet inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies. And now, here is your host, Dr. Indranil Ghosh, award-winning author, investor, and advisor to global leaders. Hello and welcome to Impact Unicorns. In this episode, I'm delighted to welcome Louis Ferro, chairman of Empire State Greenhouses, a circular economy mega platform for food, energy, and waste. Empire State Greenhouses is building a network of 400,000 square foot controlled environment vertical farming facilities across the U.S. Each crop factory will produce 20 tons of fresh fruit, vegetables, and herbs every day and will be powered by energy from on-site solar panels, manure digesters, and waste-to-energy plants. The company will also produce its own biodegradable packaging from waste plastics, which would otherwise pollute our soil and oceans. In this podcast, we'll learn how Lewis is working with leading-edge technologists, agricultural colleges like SUNY Cobleskill, local communities, and a variety of public and private funding sources to develop his ambitious projects. Empire State Greenhouses represents a triumph of public-private partnership, and Lewis has proven himself to be a master of this art form, an essential capability for building impact unicorns. Lewis, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Indrell. It's good to be with you again. Lewis, um, I'm always fascinated by your work. Um, you're working on large-scale vertical farming, you know, waste to energy, uh, converting uh, waste to bioplastics. It's all extremely uh, fascinating and part of the circular economy that we're heading towards. But this isn't a space that you were always in. I'm, I'm very curious how you uh, got to this place. Um, tell us a little bit about your personal journey. Sure. Um, well, um, I'd say that over the last 30 plus years of experience, uh, my background is quite varied um, in that uh, I, I've gone, I studied international relations, political science in college, undergraduate and then graduate school. I actually worked in, in the field of politics. Um, I worked in international relations. I worked at the UN. I worked at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and it was a career I thought I was going to pursue uh, until you realize that it's not one in which uh, the compensation is quite great, uh, unfortunately. But it's something that certainly um, is a passion for me. I still follow it. I still love it. Um, and I think what it did give me an opportunity to do is really think about problems and solutions, but from a global perspective. Uh, it, it allowed me to really um, pivot and think about issues connecting the dots from a global macro perspective. And I think that um, frame uh, from which I began working at a very early, early age uh, really gave me an opportunity to, to, to be open-minded, to learn about different backgrounds and experiences and what have you. And I ended up actually probably in 1995, after I left the Council on Foreign Relations, I ended up starting a company with a very good friend of mine um, that was in the uh, digital media space. Uh, we were focused on developing a company that was going to be tracking uh, various media, advertising online when people didn't know what online was. We did that for a bit. It didn't go anywhere. We had a few clients, in, including IBM and a few others, sold that for next to nothing and um, ended up uh, going back in uh, and working for one of our clients. Uh, so I all of a sudden pivoted from the world of first international relations and politics uh, to being an entrepreneur in the internet space to pivoting again to go working in management consulting at Deloitte, where I spent a few years um, focusing on supply chain and internet and technologies and all that. And that actually gave me some interesting experiences working at Deloitte because it allowed me to actually look at areas of technology that I wasn't very familiar with, uh, including asset management, uh, digital asset management, and looking at uh, uh, the rights of uh, intellectual property, what have you. And I ended up 
without a background, working with a lot of music entertainment industry um, and worked with companies like Microsoft and, and Google and some of the other large players at the time that were looking to get into the space as it was evolving. And that led me to start another company, um, uh, one in which I actually built uh, an asset management system with a few partners. And one of my current partners, Richard George, was my uh, uh, CTO back then. And we did that for a while until the whole internet space just imploded, if you remember back in the early 2000s. And um, back then, I had met a few years earlier one of my current partners, Jennifer Firon, and she actually talked me into going into finance. And my background was not in finance, didn't know anything about it other than what you know you read in a newspaper in a Wall Street Journal and New York Times. And she convinced me that really I should think about finance more from the perspective of that, and this is a, to data ourselves here, I had a great Rolodex that I knew a lot of people having worked in international relations. And so that allowed me to start going in and working in the world of finance, essentially making introductions, helping companies raise money, um, you know, putting together business plans, what have you. And we, we've been doing it now since early 2000, Jennifer and myself. And that allowed us to work in a number of different areas and focus in technology, medical devices, healthcare. We eventually did some M&A work. Um, and back around 2010, we started focusing more on physical commodities where I started actually trading physical commodities. I did everything from agriculture, uh, so, such as poultry. I did uh, uh, mining, uh, such as iron ore. I did energy as well. And that also gave me another um, huge uh, opportunity to learn about the field of commodities and some of the issues related to um, supply chain issues, how food is bought and sold, understanding the entire agricultural supply chain. And so my experiences really were providing me, I think, the underpinning um, and the information, the knowledge and experience of what would allow us to do what we're doing today. And uh, about uh, eight, nine years ago, Richard uh, approached me uh, he was finishing up his PhD, and he suggested that we really think about um, using small little greenhouses uh, to actually grow food and using solar. And that started, um, you know, an initial uh, thought process on the entire supply chain. And having, again, a very global perspective, we realized there was an opportunity. If you look at commodity prices in the last 10 years, 12 years, you start looking at population growth, you start looking at climate change, that there was an opportunity for us to actually change um, essentially the entire process of growing food and, and how uh, farming should actually take place, uh, particularly if you're able to leverage renewable energy and, and agriculture and also thinking about uh, how we can actually be part of the solution rather than the problem going forward. Mm. Well, I find your um, personal background so interesting because you've worked in so many areas and it feels like with each new venture, with each new uh, initiative, you've learned more and more about the global system. And perhaps if you reflect on the different businesses that you've launched, have they, do you think, you know, been more and more ambitious in terms of disrupting the system to have more positive impact because you found Absolutely. so many connections between, the, you know, the, the, the political backdrop, um, the environmental requirements that we have today, but also your understanding of solar and commodities. T tell us how you sort of put those connections together to come oh. up with your current venture, which seems to be the most ambitious yet. Sure. I, I think... Um, Clearly, when you're undertaking a project like we are in Cobalt Skill, um, uh, there, there are certain elements that are important. Um, have, working very closely with some of my uh, partners, such as Richard George, who's probably done over a thousand uh, renewable energy projects. I've learned a lot just listening to him, going through things with him. So it's been, you know, through osmosis, I've really learned a lot. Uh, talking through all these issues, uh, learning about the, the entire the entirety of the commodity space and how it works. Um, understanding technology, having worked in technology myself, and how that can be disruptive as well. Um, I, a project like this, because it's a quasi-public private entity, also requires a great deal of 
astuteness in the political arena, understanding how government works, being able to navigate uh, all the various issues, because you're dealing, especially in the United States, you're working with local, county, state, and federal um, uh, governments. You're dealing with regulation in water, in food, and energy, and waste, heavily regulated industries. You've got to deal with agencies. You've got to deal with politicians uh, themselves. So I think my background in so many different areas really gave me the breadth of experience and having studied what I did and having worked in politics allowed me to navigate through all the issues and put together something like this. Otherwise, you'd probably have to go out and hire uh, a consulting firm, a lobbying firm, or what have you to get some of this stuff mm -hmm. done. I, I intuitively knew how to handle some of this stuff, knew who to go to automatically. So we probably were able to put something th together uh, in a more efficient and uh, solid uh, way just because of that experience. Before we go any further, can you tell us a little bit about what the Empire State Greenhouses um, business model is? And you have one initial project in Cobalskill. I'd like you to give yeah. a high level view on what that project consists of, but also, you know, what the bigger picture uh, plan is for the long term. Sure. Yeah. Our first project is in um, Cobalskill, New York. Uh, we're in partners with SUNY Cobleskill, which is one of the two four-year four ag programs in the SUNY system. Uh, the other one is Cornell. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I touched on, you know, we, we just having a global perspective, uh, caring about life on Earth, uh, dealing with climate change, um, looking at population growth that by 2050 is going to be close to about 10 billion people on the planet. And our current systems of agriculture and food distribution and land, uh, the availability of clean drinking water, um, there are some serious issues. And we realized that we needed a better way, uh, to, uh, a completely new way of approaching the looming disaster that, that's coming with food production and what have you. Uh, and our team realized that there was a, uh, another part to this puzzle that we needed to incorporate, learning from various individuals that we've spoken to, we realized that waste also was a huge opportunity for the business model. And that if we can use energy, waste and food together uh, in a fully integrated uh, circular economy model, we could do something that would be phenomenal. And so what we're doing in Cobalt Skill is building a large 400,000 square foot facility. We're going to be use, use a vertical growing rack system. So we're going to have roughly almost 800,000 uh, square feet of growing space. Uh, we're going to be uh, powering that with renewable energy. So we'll have solar, we'll have geothermal. We're also going to have a uh, biogas digester. And there's another technology we're going to be employing called the gasifier. Um, that the university, the SUNY Foundation, and one of the professors came up with who invented it, they have a patent on, and we're going to be leveraging that as well to generate clean energy, being completely energy independent. Not only energy being independent, but more importantly, we're going to be able to actually take something that was a cost basis, energy, which anybody doing vertical or any other type of uh, business in, in the ag space you have to pay for energy and energy represents 35% of the embedded cost of food. We're going to be making money off energy. So we basically turn the traditional model upside down and nobody is doing that right now. We're only familiar with one company, I believe in Denmark, that's thinking about building a greenhouse powered by, um, I believe it's windmill power, uh, but they are, they're only trying to get to net zero. We have the ability by setting up our model the way we have to actually take it to the next step, which is to go carbon negative, so that we will be taking uh, car, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, actually that would otherwise go into the atmosphere, and we're able to repurpose it and actually generate oxygen, which is really unique. So for us, the whole social and economic impact of the carbon negative vertical farming is enormous. You're thinking about food security, food safety, and tackling climate change at the same time. Over the past 20 years, I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs to build impact unicorns. In my experience, every company that has a transformative positive effect on the world does so by building strong partnerships with communities, investors and governments to solve society's biggest challenges. If you'd like to learn more about how innovative entrepreneurs can help to build a more sustainable and inclusive future, read my award-winning book, Powering Prosperity, a Citizen's Guide to Shaping the 21st Century. Tell us about the, the job creation and the 
carbon impact? Yeah, can you put it into um, terms that help people understand the magnitude of what you're achieving? Sure. sure. Um, when you think about um, things like the metrics of our project, just to give you some, some basic numbers, um, the project itself is roughly about 100 million or so. Uh, we're going to be creating roughly about 100 full-time direct jobs and about 400 indirect jobs. In a Say in a town, which is a college town of about 2,800 people, that's a lot of jobs. Um, it's a rural community. Uh, again, we're partners with SUNY Coble School. We're working with the state of New York. Uh, we're going to be working very closely with them. The idea is that we're, by working with the local community, we're able to also mitigate some of the issues that they have, um, we're, such as waste, for instance. And the idea that manure uh, on dairy farms would, would otherwise sit in the open field or seep into the ground and contaminate water, we're able to process that waste. Um, we're able to use various other technologies um, for the system itself, allows us to save roughly about 234 million gallons of water. Um, it's a 95% savings over the conventional equivalent of farming, and we're going to be using about 9 million gallons of rainwater harvested, which provides basically the majority of the irrigation that we're going to need for the plants. Um, we're, we're basically looking at a 24-hour harvest to local, a 200-mile radius delivery, um, which eliminates roughly 94% of the carbon footprint. Instead of shipping food from the West Coast to the East Coast, we're able to do it here locally. Uh, we're gonna be basically processing that waste, about 220,000 tons of liquid dairy manure into pipeline grade biogas and uh, composted digestate that converts that dairy manure uh, from that would otherwise be in a lagoon um, into the gas that's sold to heat homes, trucks, or what have you. And then the CO2 essentially uh, is scrub or what we call scrub, then it's, uh, pumped into the greenhouses, thereby yielding a higher, um, larger crop, better crop, what have you. And it's essentially photosynthesis on steroids, if you will. Uh, we're also basically uh, looking to the number of CO2 that we're gonna be saving is approximately about 50,000 tons on the greenhouse side uh, a year, which is the equivalent of about, you got to figure about 11,000 cars off the road because you're reducing transportation. You're basically uh, using electric and biogas vehicles. Um, by virtue of that, we're basically able to take the biogas digester and the composting of the manure. Uh, we're using energy efficiency lighting. Uh, we're going to have a combined heat and power. Uh, we've got the gasifier that's going to process roughly uh, 26,000 tons of waste. We're going to have 12 to 14 megawatts of solar. Uh, and we're going to be doing the greenhouse plant carbon sequestration. So there's a lot of savings there. And I think that's the model to get to ultimately carbon negative. Well, there's a lot there. And let me just yeah. sort of peel it back one by one. So first of all, you've got a gigantic growing facility that's producing, as I understand it, 20 tons of food per day. 40,000 40, pounds a day. 40,000 pounds, uh, which is about 20 tons <laughs> per day. Amazing, mm -hmm. first of all. And that's all within 200 mile radius of the, the greater Manhattan, New York, tri-state yeah, area. Okay. So the transportation relative to where this type of food is grown in California, Arizona is, is uh, so much closer and therefore the transportation costs so much lower. And so is the carbon footprint. Correct. You're creating a hundred direct college level you know, jobs, so well-paid jobs uh, in a, in a rural area and also obviously engaging the SUNY Agricultural College and mm -hmm. providing job opportunities for, for their students. So huge, uh, you know, benefit. But let me just walk through the business model and make sure, you know, I, I fully understand it. So on the one hand, you're taking waste, which is like dairy manure or other um, municipal you know, agricultural waste, and you're converting that to energy through your gasifier. So you're actually making waste into a revenue stream because you get paid to take that waste, right? And then you convert it into energy, some of which is used in your um, powering um, your greenhouse and some of it is, is left over. <laughs> On top of that, you've got solar energy, you've got geothermal energy. So you've got more, much more energy than you actually need. So you're actually an energy net energy producer in right. addition to having 
essentially your, your own energy generated for, for your growing facility. Then on top of that, um, you've got your circular economy going. So any of the agricultural waste that you're producing, you send back into your gasifier, right? And reprocess it to energy. So you're taking care of your own waste. Um, and then from what I understand, you also have a you know, bioplastics packaging um, facility okay. on site. Tell us a little bit about that, because as I understand it, you're converting some of the waste into actually bioplastics that you use for your own packaging. And then there's le- enough left over that you can actually sell that packaging to other customers. Right. Yeah, the, the, the concept um, of a carbon negative food energy waste system, or what we call FEW, uh, is the opportunity to basically take waste processing and use waste of different types and put it through the entire uh, system, if you will, and you get different outputs. Now, if you're, you know, if you're basically utilizing, say, uh, um, food waste with the gasifier uh, or plastic, you can have a combination, anything that's got carbon in it, essentially, you could put in through the gasifier. Uh, it's a process to make um, a polymer known as PHA, and the name is too long, and I'm, I'm, I'll screw it up, so I'm not gonna try to pronounce it. Um, but the PHA basically, it goes through a, a heating process and a, a fermentation process, if you will, like if you're making spirits or if you're making beer, and you combine it with a bacteria. There's about 150 different types of bacteria, and that output ultimately is a biodegradable polymer known as PHA. And depending on the inputs, the outputs could be different, but essentially you can get different types of packaging that will allow for biodegradable packaging. Usually um, that material will take about three years to decompose and it can decompose in marine environments, which right now, we, as you know, we've got a lot of plastic going to the ocean. So if something is able to decompose in the actual ocean, it's fabulous. Um, and, and that's really the goal. And now we meet our own needs because instead of going out and having to spend three, four, five million dollars on packaging and finding somebody that can do this for us, we actually make our own packaging and we can look to other folks that are interested in agricultural products or food products and we can actually make packaging for them. And so we close the entire loop. It is a circular economy. And then whatever waste that we produce, um, we're able to then put it back in and process it again. So it's a completely closed loop system. It's same, the same way that dairy manure the, from the cows that are out there, we're processing that, you know, we're basically getting uh, methane for the, to, to heat homes or vehicles. We're able to get the CO2 and we repurpose the CO2 to pump it into the greenhouses for the plants to use and they exhale their oxygen. Um, and we, we also get a multitude of other products that we can sell and we're able to take advantage and get uh, paid on the RIN credits and, and, and the low carbon credits from California. The great part about this model is that while other companies have tried doing stuff like this, they typically end up paying for the waste, for their feedstock. The reality is that there's a huge industry set up already that exists where if you haul away the waste, you get paid what's called a tipping fee. And so you're being paid to haul waste. It becomes free feedstock for what we need. We're able to take that waste, reprocess it, and you put it right through the system again. Well, how good is this, right? So you're taking waste, getting paid to do it. You're converting it into energy, um, bioplastics, and um, other fertilizers and substrates for your growing uh, environment. Um, you're producing energy from renewable sources, like solar geothermal and from the mm-hmm. waste processing. Sure. And any carbon dioxide that's produced through all of this is pumped back into the greenhouse to let the plants breathe. And you're producing at such a large scale that you're actually selling energy and uh, packaging to other customers beyond your own needs. So not surprisingly, the e- economics of this are really extraordinary. It'd be great if you could just walk us through on this chart, you know, how the economics of what you're doing, just for the food part of it, just the food production part of it, how the economics is so dramatically different from the traditional farming approach. Sure. sure. The, the, the basic concept is that if you take a, uh, if you're looking at a comparative economics food production and what we looked at, the conventional produce farm, okay? If you're, if you're starting out with 100% of your uh, revenue, um, if you look at the chart, you're able to see that energy has a cost, uh, labor is a cost, uh, depreciation, packaging, transportation, fertilizer, seeds, 
others. The reality is that at that 100% of revenue, what you're able to actually capture on a, as a traditional farmer is roughly about 10%. That's a huge, huge problem and because there's a huge cost factor when you look at the integrated circular uh, model that we're talking about if you start out at that same hundred uh, percent of crop revenue which you realize that with energy with the tipping fees and all that you're actually making money on it. it's not a cost basis it's an it's a profit center the same thing with the pha and the packaging instead of us having to pay for packaging we're actually Covering our own costs, making money off it. Fertilizers, the exact same thing. The only place that you're going to see costs, which are less than the other side, are going to be in labor depreciation, transportation, where reduced transportation costs, because in addition to not transporting it from the West Coast, being set up the way we are in the location that we are, we're also able to take a situation where you can partner up with distributors and wholesalers and they can actually come and pick it up FOB. So you're reducing your transportation costs, your seed costs are standard and the other. And it just means that all of a sudden you're able to capture 80%, 80%, 80 percent, 80% EBIT margin. That is incredible. Right. 80%. Exactly. Wow. And if that weren't good enough, tell us a little bit about, you know, the fact that you're doing good in the circular economy and having all this positive impact. Tell us about some of the um, incentives and support that you're getting from public stakeholders for your project. Sure, the, 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 basically the state of New York has been uh, quite good to, for us to work with. Um, we received roughly about 54, $55 million of total incentives from the state of New York. And that's from everything from Empire State Development Corporation, NYSERDA, uh, the Industrial Development Agency in Schoharie County there. Um, uh, there. There are other agencies uh, and uh, utilities that we're speaking to, NIPA. Um, there, there's uh, just a couple of different agencies and county agencies that we're also working through that are supporting what we're doing, providing us funding. Um, for infrastructure, for, you know, for water or what have you that we need to get this thing out. The idea is that we probably um, will get total incentives. When you think of the macro perspective, it's going to be about 14, 15% of the monies that are coming in um, are going to come from incentives. So it's really a fabulous model. We don't need them to be profitable but we'd be foolish not to take them. And the idea, the idea I think is that the state of New York uh, in this case and many other states are encouraging companies to do what we're doing, to be energy efficient, to be net zero or even go beyond that uh, and to have an impact and to create jobs, lot, jobs particularly in rural areas. And as you know, and you know from your book, the reality is that's what we're failing to do. We're failing to create good jobs in rural areas. And there's some great technologies that are being developed in some major urban metropolitan areas, but are not necessarily being transported and being brought to the rural areas. This is a way to bridge the gap between the two. That's a fabulous point that you make, which is how to bridge the, the gap so that we don't have, you know, um, economies going in different directions and increase the inequality gap. Instead, <laughs> what you're doing is not just doing something that's carbon negative and you know impact rich all around, you're actually delivering that impact in rural areas where sometimes you know the, the economic uh, growth that has come from uh, recent technologies and impact businesses haven't been felt as much as in the cities. And now you're helping to reverse that balance and actually create incredible new growth opportunities that are natural resource related, but in rural mm -hmm. areas. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, and, uh, absolutely. When you talk about inequality, a lot of it is driven by technology and the efficiencies of technology. And that's usually in large urban areas and cities and what have you. And we can take some of that know-how and help bring it to a rural area that otherwise would never have the opportunity to take advantage of this. So I, I think that that's an, a model that I think works well and it works well not just here in the United States but internationally. So tell us a little bit about the demand that you're seeing for your model. I mean you you're you're getting the Cobal Skill facility up and running. You're you're well on the way to doing that, but you've uh, largely because of your political contacts and uh, network from your previous experiences, you have a lot of demand for, around the country and around the world from from what I can understand. Yeah, we, we've been, I think the last two or three years, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've been approached by different uh, uh, groups, 
people have made introductions. But we, uh, in the last two years, we spent a lot of time in Indiana, um, Pike County in particular, that's south, southwest Indiana. Uh, we know some folks there. We met with the Department of Agriculture uh, in Indiana. They really like what we were doing, and they made introductions to Purdue University and Vincennes University in Indiana. Um, they both liked what we were doing, told us that we were unique in the country. Purdue offered a partnership uh, with their PhD program in uh, CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture, uh, Vincennes as well. Uh, and Indiana came in and made us an offer uh, for an incentive package to build one or two there. We've got uh, several other locations in New York. We've got uh, SUNY Stony Brook on Long Island offers 50 acres uh, to build a facility out there. Uh, we're working closely right now with New York University uh, for a project that we're uh, in conjunction with them for the city of New York uh, that would be developed on Rikers Island when Rikers Island ultimately gets converted from an existing prison. Um, we are in discussions with Ohio State University, uh, which is really fabulous. They are looking at possibly having us to look to develop one or two as well. Um, and just the other day, I mean, by virtue of this uh, facility that we have right here, these webinars, these podcasts, I did one, as you probably recall, a few weeks ago in England. Um, and it was a state of uh, circular economy and agriculture and energy um, for a farming community. And it was posted on LinkedIn and the director of commerce for the state of Rhode Island reached out. And in fact, I'm going to be going there tomorrow, uh, set up a meeting because the state of Rhode Island is now very interested in us possibly developing something in conjunction with Johnson and Wales College. Uh, which has a strong agriculture background and the University of Rhode Island. So a meeting with the presidents and various state uh, agencies, what have you, to discuss this. So we're getting, we, we've got calls from several other states, Tennessee, Arizona. Uh, we're, we've gotten calls uh, and interest from folks in Canada, uh, from Singapore, from Australia, from places in the Middle East and in Europe as well. And I think the concept is that this is a model that is both scalable you can replicate it and it works in almost any environment. This works just as well also in a desert environment because of the water issue. And as you know, what's going on right now in the Western part of the US with the heat and the drought and everything that's going on, I think this becomes even that much more compelling. Yeah, in time and in certain locations, the water might be even more important than any of the other factors or savings that you're making. So that's terrific. Well, not surprisingly, you're having a, a lot of momentum in your current funding round. Tell us about how the, the fundraising is going. Um, it's good. Everything is starting to move along. I, I think in the last three to five months, what's happened is we saw an opportunity to go beyond just the food side of the business. We had the opportunity to develop uh, a, a business unit on the um, PHA for the bioplastics through waste. Uh, and we also had the opportunity to also develop an energy um, type business unit. And as a result, when we originally were going out, try to raise a certain amount, uh, we were trying to raise 10 million in equity. It was very difficult to get the institutions, the large banks and other family offices to pay attention because they typically wanted a much larger round um, that they're not going to come in at that small amount uh, or talking to individuals. Now that we've actually created a consolidated model that incorporates the three business units, uh, the energy, the, the waste, and the food, um, there's a greater interest now. We're, so we're chatting with quite a number of family offices, um, major banks, uh, banks like Deutsche Bank and others. Um, and we're, we're really excited now because it just seems like everything's coming together. Uh, and we're hoping to uh, move this thing forward. In fact, we're one of our advisors whom you know, Nick Sangermano, made an introduction to a couple of solar developers and solar developers basically are working through a proposal where they'll come in and they'll actually finance the development of uh, uh, the solar array for us. So we're hopefully uh, looking at developing something, an agreement, coming to some sort of an agreement with them in the next month or two. Fantastic. So you're looking for 30 million now instead of the 10 because of the... Right. The three uh, different lines of uh, business, all in this integrated facility. You've got right. different types of investors coming in, um, so the prospects are very strong. And of course, you've got this pipeline, this gigantic pipeline from different parts of the U.S. and internationally. So, where can people find out more about everything that you're doing? Because this, this is uh, such a great story. Sure, they can just go to our website, uh, www.empirestategreenhouses.com. So it's Empire State Greenhouses, plural, dot com. They can take a look. Uh, they can submit questions, reach out. Um, 
happy to answer anything. Uh, our marketing guy is very happy to send out information. They can download various uh, documents that are on there. Um, or just Google me and Empire State Greenhouses and uh, happy to uh, get back to people. Fantastic. Lewis, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's always great to hear uh, your new developments. And good luck with the, the fundraising and the launch of uh, all your facilities. Great. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode of Impact Unicorns, don't forget to rate and review this show by scrolling down and clicking Rate This Podcast. And join me next week as I talk to more inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies.